Joe and I uh, uh, shared a journey through Edinburgh College of Art um, in the uh, late 80s. Um, jo was born in Yorkshire, but once she was in Scotland, she's been here ever since. Uh, she trained at Edinburgh College of Art and she has won numerous awards, uh, travelling to uh, Italy, uh, Rome, um, America. She's taught at Edinburgh College of Art and also taught uh, in, in other areas around the world. Her work as a printmaker, as an artist and somebody who uses technology and uh, engages with music is an incredible a backlog of exhibitions and events and performances, most recently at the Royal Scottish Academy Finlay Room, uh, the, the exhibition uh, in uh, nine, uh, 2019. So um, we're going to let Jo tell us more about her story, uh, the story of where she is in the studio in Glasgow at the Wasps at the Gallowgate. So I'll hand you over. Uh, welcome, Jo. Hi. Thanks, Robbie. That's uh, an, a nice introduction. Um, and yeah, we share quite a history. In actual fact, I was at Edinburgh College of Art in 1983. So um, uh, I, I actually come from the early 80s there, as it were, or right the way yeah. through them. I didn't leave till 89. Um, I don't know quite how I managed that. Something about the five-year fine art MA degree, I think, and wanting to study history of art as well as art. But anyway, let me begin properly. Thank you, all of you, for being here. At the moment, I can only see five of you, um, but hopefully I'll see more of you in question times. Um, I'm actually going to pretend there's nobody there and I'm just talking to, the, to Robbie and uh, Elena so that I don't get too nervous about this. But it is lovely to think that you've all come and want to have a look at my work and come into my studio. I only wish that you could have actually kind of walked through the door, as it were, uh, uh, so that you could physically look at things and handle things. But I'll do my best uh, to show you this. Uh, I've been in this studio space for, I'm, I'm almost horrified to admit, for over 25 years. I think I moved in in about 1993. I'd been in Glasgow for a little over a year. Um, I moved down from Aberdeen, having worked at Peacock Printmakers, as it was then. Um, and. I got a space on the top floor of what is a B-listed factory, old factory building. It used to be part of Saracen Foundry Steelworks. And it's, I say the top floor because we always think ourselves a little special on the top floor. It was found, this building was found by Jackie Parry, who you may well know from the Royal Scottish Academy. Uh, and her paper making studio is here. She found this building because she needed space for herself and she knew a number of artist friends who did before I arrived in Glasgow. And I was tremendously lucky to be introduced to her and get a space here. When I did, I, I moved into what was a space without a single wall. The ethos of the top floor was that we were open plan and communal. And although there were some partitions so that you could pin drawings up and paintings, in general, we, there was a general decision just not to have walled in spaces with doors. And this really did give a great communal feeling. You could always, I could always look across and see another artist painting, which made me work harder. Um, if ever I needed something heavy carrying, I could always just ask somebody to do that with me and vice versa. If I saw someone struggling, I hope I always was keen to just dive out and help them. So it was a really lovely way of being introduced to Glasgow when I first came here as quite a young artist. Now, of course, I have built walls. My first wall, and I'm going to give you a little tour of the studio just by moving my laptop around. I'm going to do it as smoothly as possible so that you don't feel sick uh, because I'm told that happens if I move too fast. So bear with me and I'll, I'll be quite brief at this stage and then I will talk in greater depth about work by showing you a PowerPoint and then I'll come back into the studio space uh, and speak a little bit more and invite questions. And if I go on for too long, Robbie's going to stop me. He's promised. Um, but when I first moved into this space, as I say, there was no walls. I was very lucky because Elspeth Lamb was expanding her studio and so she 
took one of her walls down and she gave it to me which is extremely nice of her and it was a bit wobbly having had to move sort of three meters to become my wall instead of hers but then June, June Carey moved in behind and she put another wall up against it and I, I still use it that'll be the last wall you see in the in this tour one thing that this space is used for is storage as I think most artist spaces are um, and that means that the work I have here especially because I'm a printmaker and I create multiples. I keep archive copies of pretty much everything I've ever made. So there's a lot of work here going right back to my degree show. Uh, the piece that you can see um, over here is a photo, quite a recent photo etching. It's uh, two plates. It's etched into two steel plates, each of them exactly the size of the image registered on one another and I might discuss a little bit more about photo etching if anybody wants me to get technical at the end but what I'm trying to do I think through this talk if it has a theme at all the work that you will see is very diverse because it's over such a long period but what I try to do for my own benefit as well as yours to rationalize my my working sort of ideas sometimes is to consider which images are still potent and important and also what qualities and characteristics I keep returning to. I think most artists return to similar things throughout their careers. Um, on the surface, I might appear to do that less than others, but I can see it when I really think, think about it. Um, and in that this is, I hope, an image that is quite ambiguous, but suggests reality, it, is parallel to the picture plane, it suggests space. Um, that is something that I have done a lot or wanted to do a lot in my career. And only my recent work, am I kind of breaking that mold to kind of use this, the very surface? For me, it's all about the picture plane, what's on, on top of it and what's, what's kind of pushing behind it. So if I, if I leave your vision so that I can move my laptop around and just give you a really quick, a quick tour, you'll begin to see my planchette drawers, which are crucial to my practice just so that I can store an awful lot of work. You'll see the recent prints and uh, watercolours that I've been showing at the Royal Scottish Academy Academicians in Isolation exhibition. Uh, just stored in there, strategically opened at that drawer, of course. <laughs> and then if I move round to this wall, um, that is an old etching that I did when I first came to Glasgow in about 1991, that I made at Glasgow School of Art when I was artist in residence there. Um, and as such, it's one of the first images that I did that was that used colour and multiple pla plates and layers. Um, and again, it's very much about ambiguous spaces. When I was a student, I was, I was kind of blown away when I moved from Yorkshire to Edinburgh simply by the architectural space and that kind of beautiful spaces. Yorkshire is a beautiful place, but I come from a small town. And at the time, as a young person, I may have had that sin of familiarity and contempt, I think. And I just didn't even see the space. So, but Edinburgh seemed like uh, a fairy tale. And so I became very involved with architectural space, but I kind of moved away by this period to something that was much more timeless. And I don't know, about a sense of space and architectural space and light and shadow rather than any particular topographical place, which is what I never really have been about. This is a small etching that does similar things. Um, planes of, of colour, of aquatint and lines that I kind of felt were almost figurative, these verticals. It's amazing how anything vertical is vaguely figurative, but really just one thing moving in front of another as a subject matter. Um, yeah, I should say as well, um, because I, I became aware of this the more I'm looking at my own screen, is 
you're seeing this back to front, which is really weird for you when you're looking at art. The good thing about that when you're looking at prints, however, is that's the way it would have been on the etching plate. But the print is the other way round. So there you sure. go. I think actually we, we see it the right way around. I think you see it the wrong way around, I think. Oh, OK. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Could be wrong on that, but I think that's correct. Oh, well, that's I'm actually quite pleased about that. That's uh, what it, it is quite strange seeing everything back to front. Um, Anyway, so if I move you further round, we go past storage and we get to what actually is a whole wall that is a window. It's got lots of small planes of glass and I tend to cut them out entirely with blinds because late afternoon I just get too much light coming in and I can't see anything in the space. Uh, but you can see I've got a huge glass palette, brushes, my blue paint which will become significant you'll see in a minute and if I move you again um, that's my tools uh, the poster of the exhibition I had in Lithuania Academy strung up there for no reason and then this you may be familiar with just if you visited my website at all this was the relief print woodcut a uh, laser cut woodcut that I printed just before lockdown. It's the only copy that I have. I have another eight copies that simply have three black blobs printed on, waiting for all the layers of green semicircles to be printed on top. But that was the first proof. And I'm kind of pleased that I just managed to get it done before lockdown so that I have something. <laughs> but really, I'm really looking forward to being able to print the rest because it's not quite right. And then if I turn further around, this, this is one of a series of paintings. They're gouache and graphite that I've been doing actually for a long time now. I always work in series. So for every work that I've shown you, although it might, as I say, one might seem very different to another, but each one has a whole suite of work attached to it that puts things in context. And... So if I just show you this, and I will talk about it more clearly when I get to my PowerPoint, but you can kind of see what it's about. And that's just blue gouache filling in rectangles. I have completed two of them. They each took me about three months. And that is my kind of occupation. Uh, when I could, for the first month of lockdown, I couldn't come into this studio space. I managed to rescue that drawing board with a paper stretched onto it just before they locked us out entirely. And it was kind of a really good, slightly neurotic, meditative thing to do uh, during that first sort of few months. I still haven't finished it. There's large areas that uh, will finally be done. And if I swing you round a little bit further and tip, you see I've just begun a fourth in the series. So if I can make you comfortable now, and I'm going to share my screen for a PowerPoint, unless there's any questions at this point which I could answer. Um, but if nobody has, then I'll go ahead and I'll try and probably a little bit more here and there's that. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, they can use the chat and I can relay that to Joe or you can put your hand up and I will uh, unmute you. Okay, so can F, can you now see my yes. PowerPoint, Robbie? Yes. Okay, so this is work that, as I say, it goes obviously 1984, 1990, 1998. Um, I go from that architectural piece that 1984, I was in first year at Edinburgh College of Art. And that was about, I think the 10th etching I'd ever made. And it's of a gable end in Leeds actually. And it's, it's not entirely typical of the street scenes I were doing. I was doing at the time, which were more perspectival, but I think it was the best for that. 
And although I didn't know what to do, with, in a sense, to extend that idea at the time, this notion of that kind of symmetrical image with a plane of texture or, or incidence that is parallel to the picture plane and just a little further back to create a quite shallow space is something that you can, I think, see me going back to over the next, right the way through the 1990s and, and further on up to 2000. And I still do. It's that shallow overlapping. But of course, these early works in black and white have a kind of uh, maybe expressive quality about them that my later work slowly pairs back and uh, makes quieter as I introduce colour very subtly. So that gable end is, is the first piece and then the, the second piece in, I made in Rome in 1990. And it's a steel plate etching and it is uh, really quite large. It's about four three feet, four feet tall, uh, and, f and three, three, three and a half across. And I had to make it in two halves, in an acid bath built from polythene and chicken wire in the car park, which Bartolo dos Santos at the Slade, actually, who was a visiting lecturer, told me I should do if I wanted to do really big plates. You just, you just build walls with bricks, Joe, and then put polythene in and then put your plate in and pour nitric acid on top. That uh, may be too technical for some of you. Really, it doesn't matter, but it's very gestural. It's made very much, very freely in the moment of making, if that makes sense. It's not too planned. I had a notion of what I wanted to say, what the image was, but the marks in it are accidental. And I know, f for example, the great drips down the center are made because I poured uh, a solvent through the wax ground of the plate and just tipped the plate upwards and let it pour down and destroy half of the image that I'd drawn before that. Um, whereas the image in 1998 called Monument, which is about a meter and a half wide by now, by now I'm using Glasgow Print Studio, which has uh, I think the second biggest etching press in Scotland. Peacock does have larger, but the Takash at Glasgow is fabulous. And that's three steel plates, and I'm printing these layers of colour, one over the other, very transparent, to get that sort of effect. Oh, now I'm trying to turn over, and it's not letting me. There we go. Okay. And then this one in 2000, Opposition one is a similar thing and even quieter. I'm still kind of obsessed by a grid quality, by a shallow depth and by one thing moving behind the other. Even in the photographic work next to it, which again is a meter and a half tall, and that's an archival inkjet print from I think 2010 that I, uh, part of that was on that Lithuania poster. Um, you know, the, there's that sort of accent of the symmetry and the grid and this sh almost shallow theatrical stage-like space that for whatever reason, and I can't really describe it in any logical way, I, I find quite moving or beautiful or just that's, that's, that's the space I always make to say what I want to say. And then my process has also changed extremely as well because while quietening down and becoming slightly more classical while maintaining that symmetry than those early gestural works, I've also decided to put away, in a sense, the modernist prejudice of my tutors at art school and decide that printmaking doesn't have to prove itself against painting by being painterly or being big or being um, made spontaneously, which I think I really genuinely did sort of feel that sort of pressure just because of the precedence of painting within Edinburgh College of Art comparative to printmaking. Um, but here, given the studio space, I started making all these small collage drawings, hundreds of them really, 
um, all on stretched pieces of leftover printmaking paper that were on boards. And then, so, th so that drawing is just, I can show you it perhaps, if you can see the small image of me. It's really not very big, it's about 12 inches wide. Um, and then that etching is, again, it's about a meter and a half wide. And it's very much about reproducing the drawing. But in doing that, it's taking these quite slight crayon marks and a really quite roughly made collage um, that I wasn't in the least precious about. And then looking at it and think, why does that work? Why do I find that beautiful? And what do I need to reproduce within this you know, monumental scale? Because if you're gonna etch those marks, be it the slightest smudge or pencil mark, into a steel plate, or into three steel plates, in fact, that this plate is, one for each color, then you have to be really sure that it's essential. I hope that makes, make, makes sense, but that, that was quite an important, uh, a real departure for me within that series of work. And it was also the first time that actually small work became quite important, as well as big work, which I think was another part of my lack of maturity early on, was I always felt good work, you know, there's an ambition for scale or scale amounted to ambition. And in fact, I think a lot of my small works don't. Uh, this is a piece of illuminated handmade paper. I show them in light boxes. They're unique pieces. I made this in 2001 in New York, in Lower Manhattan. It was quite a traumatic week because it was 9-11. Um, but the workshop, which I had to, when I, during that time, um, was amazing and 9-11 happened on the Tuesday, they reopened for me on the Wednesday. Come all that way, I was going to do it. And I remember at the time feeling slightly guilty that I was making these very abstract art pieces, and yet I'd done so much planning to make this happen, and I was so committed to these images, I carried on nevertheless. But it, it put me in this mind of wanting maybe a greater sense of subject matter. And I think that's something I go backwards and forwards with it, with that sort of debate between abstraction and if not a specific subject matter, then at least a sense. I hope these have a sense of place. They're layers of paper pulp and the lighter rectangles that you see are watermarks. And they're very, very thin pieces of linen pulp uh, that have been layered up. And shown and people always assume they're prints but they're not they are unique pieces now I get to this which is my very recent blue painting which you've seen as it were here in my studio space I, I hope you can see it in some ways more that I've talked about the work and in a way this you can see is is very like and, and very unlike all the work I've done before I mean it obviously relates to the grid and it's about surface. Um, and even its use of color is monochrome because however much I use color and even with the bright yellow piece behind me, it's a very specific use of color. However bright that yellow is, it's only the one color. And that's something, again, when I look at my work, I realize I do that. I don't really think about doing it when I'm doing it, but that's, that's the way it happens to be. But this work is different maybe for a number of reasons. One, it's a unique piece as opposed to um, being a print or something. And the things with, about prints is you can edit during the making. You plan for them because you have to put them onto steel plates or produce wooden blocks for them. And it's a process of planning and editing and then making and then maybe re-editing the image. Whereas with painting, of course, you're, you're kind of have to commit I committed to the idea of what this drawing was going to be. I started it, I took it from the, a moleskin notebook, which I'm looking for. I was going to show it to you, I'll, I'll show it to you later. But you can see a page from it, the page from it that where I took this drawing. And it, the notebook was given to me by a friend and at the time I was like, oh, I, you can't draw on that. It's got lines um, and I don't really write. And then I thought, well, no, don't be silly. You use grids. And at the time I was doing the photographic pieces, but I, I decided to use this note, one notebook to really keep my abstract muscle, if you like, alive. 
And so I started making these drawings, taking the lines as these are the horizontals, I'm going to make the verticals. But I made them in a way I've never made artwork before. I took a ruler and put it down on the left-hand side of the page near the margin, and I sort of drew short lines that covered a certain number of horizontals. So I might go three, leave a gap of one line, then another three, then leave another gap of one line, then four, and then, and then I would move the ruler just a little way uh, across, and I would start doing it again. I'd either repeat the same thing, or I would put a new sort of number, a number in, so it might be four, one, two, or something like that, four, one, two, right the way down the page. So in a sense, it was a bit like knitting, in that I didn't know what the pattern would really look like until I got a few inches in across the page, and this drawing began to appear. And I quite liked that for the first time as a strategy. I, the text in this slide, all of the planning and decisions made beforehand, and the execution is a perfunctory fair, affair, is a definition given a kind of Wikipedia definition of conceptual art. Um, in that, with the paintings, I have made all those decisions. I've scaled up the drawing, and then I've decided that I am going to colour in, in a particular blue gouache, every single alternate sort of rectangle in that blue. Um, nevertheless, the execution is by no means a perfunctory <laughs> affair. It, I'm extremely careful about, you know, crafting this piece, making sure that every rectangle is immaculate, that the paint doesn't go elsewhere. Uh, the tone of the paint changes as my brush runs out of paint, and I allow that to happen so that there's a variety. And the notion is, is that I'm kind of in control and not in control. And one le thing, this is extremely precise, extremely restrained and controlled because I, otherwise I just make it look terrible and I, I have to keep the paint within the lines of the graphite rectangles. But on the other hand, every sort of rectangle, when you look at it very closely, is different. Some of the paint is very dry, others it's very wet, some it's very faded, others it's not. And I think that's something that I've always been interested in, that notion, that dichotomy, if you like, between something that's extremely controlled and something that's nevertheless not. It might give the appearance of control, that everything's regular, but when you look at it further, you're going to discover the handmade, if you like. You're going to discover that this is, is not, is far more human. That's another page of the moleskin. Now, I got to that painting, or these moleskin drawing, drawings, as I call them. I don't think I realised I called them the moleskin drawings till I just said it there, but it'll do for now. This particular suite of drawings, and I have covered, you know, filled the whole notebook, as it were, with them. Um, I had no idea what I was going to do with them, and I was doing this photographic work, and I would maybe would never have got to using them until Raymond MacDonald, a friend of mine who is a saxophonist and a composer and prof a professor of innovation, improvisation and music at Edinburgh University, um, who's been a friend of mine for a long time, and he wanted to make graphic scores, which are visual images to direct improvised jazz music. And he asked me about that, because I was the artist he knew, and he wanted these images to sort of be visible to the musicians. So it's like, well, for me, it was easy. It's like they should be beautiful original prints in limited editions that sit on the music stand so that each musician has a really beautiful object as well as just a diagram to show them. Because graphic scores are not new by any means, they were introduced in the 60s as new ways of musical notation for experimental music. But quite often, they do look like geography diagrams. They still use traditional music a little bit. And I was determined not to do that, as was Raymond. My first step was to ask him just to give me a piece of music that he'd made recently. He gave me a beautiful piece from an album he made with Marilyn Crispell, who's a very amazing American jazz pianist uh, who lives in Woodstock, New York. 
uh, which is pretty cool, isn't it? We did get to go there. That's her at the, the, the bottom of that slide there. Um, and I scanned one of the drawings in this notebook and, I, and then I could color it in digitally. And I, the, the drawing already existed, so it gave me a kind of matrix that was mine. It was my art, it was subjective, I felt something for. But then I had this music and I, I've never listened so much to a piece of music. I split each line of that image. There's four, say it's four lines. I think you'll see what I mean. Uh, if you read it from left to right conventionally as a book, there's four lines of music. The saxophone is yellows, ochres and reds. And where it's lemon, it's very high. And where it's red, it's very deep and low. To me, that seemed almost logical to use tone in that way. I don't know if it is, but I wanted to try and get something that was quite universal and obvious that people would understand. And I just, I gave 60 seconds of the music to every line of that drawing. And then the piano is magenta and pink. So either dark magenta for deep notes and bright pink for the high notes. And I think you can get a sense of the music. If you, the top left is building up it's getting much busier and faster. There's more happening towards in the middle and towards the end, that first half of the bottom line, it's where it's getting very fast, the way that music reaches a crescendo, and then it fades out. But it also, if you listen to it and look at it, gives you a quite specific view virtually of every note or every uh, uh, sort of flair of the sax saxophone as much as I could possibly manage. And we came up with that image. And, and that, I think the thing it did for me was really make me use colour in a different way. And, and to collaborate was something very different for me. And you have to collaborate with musicians. Um, but that has been such amazing fun. And it introduced me to Marilyn Crispell, who came across to play in the Reed Hall at Edinburgh University and I ended up doing a, a suite of graphics scores with her. On a whim I invited her, I asked if she'd mind me coming to Woodstock and, and doing something with her and she leapt at the chance, she's done art projects before. And her house in Woodstock is surrounded by these beautiful forests with all these uh, verticals and horizontals. They're very shallow rooted, these trees, and they kept, they fall to make these beautiful, uh, dramatic horizontals. And I started making grids that are, I think even before I realized that they were influenced by that, or oh, that's how I see it. Um, but new grids that now, that I kind of knew the methodology, but whereas the, the pieces I'd made with Raymond were entirely abstract and they were for any musician to play, these were really for Marilyn to play because I love her music. I loved it the first time I heard it and I really wanted her to compose the piece with me. So I made the grids and Marilyn made the squiggles on top and, and the grids. Um, and she really spent a long time scoring that music that she knew how she wanted to play it. And then we recorded it. I, I'm really whisking through quite a lot of work here, but I wanted Obviously, music gives you, puts an element of time. So I became interested in time and gesture and movement, and I started animating these graphic scores. I'll just let you watch this.
Okay. So I, I think that gives you a clear, a clear idea. Uh, we made a suite of seven scores. That's uh, about the times of day. And we called it gradations of light. So there's dawn to dusk and night, basically, the night being very dark and black. And I animated all of them kind of as an explanation, in a sense, um, of, of what these were about. But again, I think you clearly see you know, the incidents and the space, the way that we're using the grid for time, and then these incidents of uh, loud or frivolous or quick moving music that we sort of came up with between us for that point. While all that was, was going on, of course, uh, other things happening, and I constantly take photographs as most of us do these days. And my partner who's relatively new to me at the time. He may be watching at the moment. Sorry, George. But he lives uh, in Falkirk, and it sort of introduced me to the wetlands along the River Karen. And all these grid formations of trees. You see, grids is the one thing that keeps coming back in any form at all. Uh, so I was looking at the grids of these trees and quite fascinated by them. But also the sort of horizontals and verticals of the grasses themselves there. And I was just obsessively taking hundreds of photographs. I think these grids kind of, when you're making artwork, however abstract, or for me anyway, you know, I was making all these matrices for Marilyn and for Raymond at the time. Um, and I'd made all these many sort of drawings in, in this notebook. And so you begin to see matrices in the world around you. And I began to see the matrix within these grasses. And of course, you don't know if other people s see them in, in that way. Why should they? And I wanted to make a work that might uh, express that. At the same time, when Marilyn uh, recorded those uh, pieces for my graphic scores, sh she recorded them as solo uh, with just her playing them. And then she recorded them again as du duets, introducing me to David Rothenberg. Uh, David is a professor across in New Jersey Institute of Technology, and he is very well known for basically jamming, playing the clarinet with birdsong. And because we, I'd made some of these grids in response to the woodland, Marilyn thought they'd be great. And he also makes electronics. So he was very complimentary about the animations of my work. And I sort of agreed that we'd agreed between us that uh, he'd send me music and I'd, I'd kind of keep animating. And we'd just bat these backwards and forwards. It was going to be one of those really lighthearted, uh, frivolous, fun projects that was no pressure. And then I got this image of what I wanted to do with these. And it became this huge piece. And he was really wonderful. and stopped in Scotland to work for a week in my studio where I directed him what sort of music I wanted and I wanted it to go from really natural of the clarinet and bird song into really very electronic so that it kind of started to have that discourse about the way this particular environment when this post-industrial environment seemed to me where it's on the one hand, it's extremely natural. It's the way we have nature. But there's always car, the hum of cars. It's very much people. It's there because the Karen Ironworks were there, which completely decimated all the wildlife there. We're just reclaiming it back. So it's that, again, if you like, it's that paradox of things that I like, of uh, the precise uh, and and the imprecise in that this is the natural and the artificial. And I wanted in some way, I wasn't quite sure, but I had this image and I'm just gonna play this. Am I okay for time, Robbie? Sorry, just unmuting. Yes, you're good. You're good. You're gonna... Okay, I'm gonna play this. It's just a, a two minute trailer for, for this film, which was two years in the making, I, I must say. It will be shown at GOMA next year in February, 2021 as uh, part of an exhibition uh, called Drinking the Beauty, uh, which is a number of female, art work, female artists who've responded to the environment and, and the effect it has. 
but see if I can get this to play for you. And then you, then you can kind of see what I'm talking about, because I don't think it's fair to us. I can't really explain it. In some ways, I hate showing you at that scale. I want it, this is it actually in the communal space of my studio projected, um, which is wall size. And at that point, the gestures, the movements through the matrix become, if you like, arm gestures, if you were painting them or drawing them, as opposed to these tiny um, sort of things on the screen. But uh, yeah, it, that's, that's for the future. So that's how I was trying to get you to make, make, make you see what I see when I, when I look at this. And at the same time, as I, was, I, as I was taking those photographs and thinking about all of that, I was making this new suite of graphic scores with Raymond, uh, Silent Music, Seeing Sound, uh, which was shown at the Academy at about this time last year. Um, I wanted to introduce a greater level of kind of material quality to the prints. And so I started using laser cutting uh, to laser cut wood to make relief prints. Previously, the graphic scores had been digitally printed archival inkjet prints, um, which, I, which I stand by. I think they're beautiful pieces. But when you're actually making a piece of work to sit on the music stand and to instruct musicians, it actually has to be much simpler visually than uh, the image of the graphic score I showed you, of the first graphic short score I showed you, because they need to be able to see quite clearly and easily what's happening and what's expected of them. Um, with, this, with these pieces, we asked the, each instrument had to relate to a colour. So there was an orange instrument, be it the guitar, um, and there was a light green instrument and a dark green instrument. And then we asked, I think, uh, the percussionist quite often or one of the instruments to be the background texture. You can actually see the grain of the wood in, in the pale blue and the more easily perhaps in the second one in the green. So I wanted these pieces to have those. And so these are isolated incidents. The background texture person where there's a big, where there's that big circle stops playing. Um, but otherwise they're playing quite quietly except for those blanks. And then there are these instruments coming in at different points. And again, maybe quite conventionally working from left to right through, uh, through this as a score. Uh, we work with very experienced improvisers improvising musicians and it's it's been a revelation the nice thing is is that the test is me because i don't play or read music 
Um, but Raymond and I decide on what the instructions are going to be for each piece. And I can tell <laughs> when something is wrong because I can follow the score as it's being played. And at one point I gave some poor musician the wrong uh, print in that the colours were in a different position. Uh, it was a proof print instead of one of the final pieces. And uh, I was like, oh, no, you've done it wrong. And they said, no, I haven't. I was like, yes, you, yes, you actually. So we, we sorted that out. But they, they, they function very much as that, at the same time as being, I hope, pieces of, of visual art. So that pretty much brings us back to where I am now. Because obviously, in some ways, obviously, uh, working with Raymond on those scores, Raymond collaborates in the making of the image and the, the choice of color and how we're going to, and then how we're going to play them, I collaborate with, within. So it's not just an entirely clear split where I make the image and he makes the music. Um, that is wonderful and difficult. And, and so all the time I was making these scores, I have to admit, I, I suddenly was collecting all these pieces, lovely pieces of wood of different shapes, and I was just dying to print them all by myself and overlap them and do things that were mine. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm doing now, making new pieces. And just for lockdown, do I have time to show this, Robbie? Yes, go on. Uh, this is the last, the last piece, and this is an animation that I made of the print that I wasn't able to print. So I'll come out and stop sharing my screen now so you can you can see me, which is I hope okay for you. Uh, Joe, um, uh, and I uh, should stop talking and you should maybe ask ask questions. I I can introduce other other things, but uh, I, I that has been an incredible insight and we feel very 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 privileged. And I wonder if I can just ask everyone just to unmute for a moment and give Joe a bigger round of applause. Thank you. Thank you all for turning up tonight. Uh, um, the, these events are um, uh, uh, going to continue on through the summer and into the early autumn. In two weeks' time, on the 30th of July, we have sculptor Kenny Hunter, who's going to show us around the foundry and his working methods. In a month's time, uh, the 6th of August, uh, we go up to Orkney, uh, for Anne Bevan, who has actually, I see Anne Bevan lurking in the windows there. Anne, can you uh, unmute a second? Hello. Hi. Hello, Anne. Hi, Thank Anne. You. Oh, Thanks um, so much. Fantastic. I really enjoyed that. And especially um, your animated sound works are brilliant. Thank you. But yes, you're going to come up to Orkney. I'll get rid of the cat. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Anne. It's lovely to see you. Yeah, and... Uh, um, and one of the one of the advantages of doing Zoom is we can we we can we can invite Anne and do more things with us uh, through the through the powers of of uh, the the, compu the computer. Um, and further on, we've got names such as Annie Cottrell, Keith McIntyre, and Mary Arnold Foster lined up, and you'll be hearing more about uh, about them. And these events are exclusively for friends and for our patrons uh, of the Royal Scottish Academy. Um, so if you know people who would like to come along to these but are not a friend, encourage them to uh, sign up and become a friend and Elena and uh, the team will be only too happy to uh, uh, welcome you to the fold. I think we'll uh, end there um, and uh, we'll, see you, we'll see you all in two weeks time for um, uh, Kenny Hunter.
Bye, everyone. Bye. Brilliant show. <laughs>